Okay, we're back. After a couple of cancellations and a long delay, apologies for that, we will finally record our final episode of the season with Celine Takatsuna, who is our new colleague at Privacy Cloud, based out of the Bay Area. Celine's been working in the data, technology and privacy spaces for more than a decade. Before joining us at Privacy Cloud, she was working on a couple of personal data projects one in healthcare and one in e-commerce. She's founded three startups, consulted with a dozen more in media, marketing and tech for good, and early on led business and strategy teams for industry pioneers like Commission Junction. I have asked Celine to give us a quick analysis of the My Data business models, which I did write about back in 2019, but we badly needed an update. I will add a link to that original reference anyhow. And without further ado, let's jump into it. Okay, Celine, thanks for joining me on this little uh, review of, of the business models around my data. Are you feeling inspired? I am feeling very inspired. Uh, since we first started this conversation and since we first met last year, there's been so much activity in the privacy space and in the my data business model space, if we can call it that. Um, We're seeing a lot of new startup activity. Uh, We're seeing a lot of new funding activity. And we're seeing a lot of new um, major players uh, taking bold steps or supposedly bold steps around privacy. So uh, it's an exciting time. Good, good. Glad to hear that. So we'll need that some of that inspiration to to go through this, and let's see if there's uh, let's see what you think about this the sort of the state of many of these uh, approaches. There's one that we had started with again a couple of years back, which was called privacy enhancement tools. This could be perhaps the most boring approach to to my data business models or business models built around people being in control of their data. And within this category, we had things like Ghostery, which now is pretty much uh, pretty too old or deprecated. Um, one thing less that would help you exercise your rights across different, uh, you know, data management platforms and across different vendors and whatnot. Then DuckDuckGo, of course, a tool that allows you to to control what's happening to your data and things like even the Brave browser, I'd, I'd guess. What do you think about that space, privacy enhancement tools? Do you see much change? What's your perception of that? Yeah, I think uh, one thing that we, you and I have talked about several times is really around the utility yes. of privacy. Privacy is utility, and I think privacy enhancement tools is something that is gaining traction, um, but getting very focused. So the utility of an ad blocker. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I've used Ghostery for years, and I'm so shocked when I go to a website on someone's browser and I see a bunch of ads because I'm I, I've forgotten what they look like. Um, I don't have that experience, so I think Ghostery is just one of those things that's in the background for a lot of people. Um, and you know, what is it? 25, 27 percent of U.S. at least browser users have ad blockers installed. Um, I think DuckDuckGo. Um, is another favorite of mine. Um, They have a lot of utility. um, And I think both Ghostry and DuckDuckGo um, have started to do what I think is is going to have to happen for privacy to really be adopted uh, in the U.S. and around the world, which is um, they they make their mission quiet. um, And they do what they're intended to do well. Those three blocks ads really, really well. DuckDuckGo gives you an incredible tracker-free search experience, right? So, um, so yeah, that's one of the areas that I think continues to grow, but it's getting a lot more um, focused. And it's probably more mature than a lot of the other models that we're seeing. And it's funny how you see how you print ad blockers here. And I, I, I think it's right. If you care about your privacy, then you also need an ad blocker. And uh, it's so that it's always being perceived as a way to remove annoyances and not being sensible to the needs of publishers. But the reality is that they, you know, they also have a function in terms of privacy. And I'm thinking of the EFF and this privacy budget that they have. And in fact, we interviewed them a few weeks ago and, and they're totally out in that space and they're approaching the ad blocker from a privacy protection perspective. 
unlike things like uBlock and, and so Yeah, on. and I think Privacy Badger is really good. Um, being a privacy geek, I do have Privacy Badger installed on one of my browsers uh, and Ghostery on the other. Uh, privacy Badger, I think, I, I, it's interesting that you bring up Privacy Badger because the difference between a Ghostery, which is really easy for any non-privacy geek to understand, Oh, look, I click on this extension I added. Oh, there it is. Done. Look at the cute little blue ghost on my browser. Versus something like Privacy Badger. Privacy Badger, I think, is really attractive to someone that doesn't understand privacy, but they know it's important. It attracts the people that are the early adopters in the privacy space. And it, it attracts the uh, technologists that have been working on privacy for a long, long time. Um, you know, you're in privacy as a technologist because of, you know, your personal principles um, or you think it's a cool technology problem um, or because you feel it's a human rights violation problem. Those are the people that I think are attracted to Privacy Badger. So it's a different audience, um, uh, but I think it will continue to grow. Certainly, it's, it's, it's definitely at the forefront. Okay, good, good. So let's move on to one that is slightly less boring, or I don't know, let's see what you think, which is user rights management platforms. And here it'd be platforms that think more about the B2B approach or from a B2B approach, they sell to businesses so that they can comply with the law. So primarily GDPR, but now, of course, all of these, all of these sort of state-specific laws across the US and many others where all these companies, they have to answer to data subject requests, portability, and so on. And, and they are enabling this through a self-service portal of sorts. Sometimes they just do consent management, which these days is just you know all over the place. But have you seen any changes in the past two years? So what do you think about that user rights management platforms? I think that, so, you know, when these, these rights management platforms or consent managers is generally the, the bucket that I put them in, when they started, yeah, they were absolutely focused on um, data rights management. I think some of them are turning into straight point solutions and they're going to be right for consolidation. Uh, others uh, are expanding their business model um, because they cover a lot more uh, than just consent managers, or they have to um, if they want to grow. So, you know, we're seeing ad revenue recovery for publishers on these consent platforms. Um, we're starting to see, um, interestingly enough, we're starting to see the con consent managers um, supporting uh, work against things like Flock, which we haven't really discussed yet, but yes. um, they are developing new ways of tracking to get around yeah. the blocking of the old ways of tracking. Um, so I, I think, I think like all good point solutions, uh, they're going to have to grow or they're going to have to get acquired. So, and I think that's going to start, that has already started happening. So something that I, that I'm thinking with consent management platforms is that they're not going to bring that much value in a few months because in the end consent is only working when you're not really asking <laughs> and to explain that better these days there's plenty of talk about uh dark patterns and how what we've been doing so far which is getting people to agree to something they can't understand and they most likely won't read doesn't qualify as valid consent and every day we see again more and more pressure at least in europe and you know to, to just make it more of a real accept versus reject question of course if you do ask properly then the sizes the sample sizes don't justify the effort because you don't have enough of a again enough of an audience to then duplicate it across the board so i wonder where these platforms are going to go when we finally get rid of this pop-ups and banners and all these annoyance. Yeah. And that's, that kind of, to me, goes along with the, the consolidation that we're seeing or the product extension. One of the things that I find fascinating, you know, I was mentioning that they're almost becoming a workaround in and of themselves uh, to get around cookie lists um, is simply that they actually are on a, a huge cross section of websites, right? Across the web. And they have a lot of data 
about each individual out there. Um, and, you know, some of the things you're starting to see is, wait a minute, this company, and I'm not going to name any names when it comes to these guys, um, but one company or another might have encountered me across, you know, yeah. 20 websites. Who needs cookies when you have consent <laughs> managers, right? Such a good point. So to me, when you look at user rights management, that is starting to converge almost. Uh, it, you, the thing it was intended originally, legislatively, um, the thing it was intended to avoid is the thing it's becoming, right? It's the best tool possible. The best way for identity resolution is through a consent manager, right? If I can't use cookies, why don't I just ask for consent? And it's like the best ally of the world that we wanna that we wanna escape. Uh, like you know, let's just trick people into consenting and the uh, biggest we... dark pattern there is right now. Exactly. Okay, let's move on then. So what about uh, self-sovereign identity tools? Are they real? Are they real? Are they evolving? What do you think about Evername? Uh, you know, all of these platforms. I know Hyperledger in these, the same thing as Evername and the same thing as I understand uh, Sovereign. But what do you think of that space? Uh, yeah, this is a kind of a fascinating space. Um, I followed early on and haven't followed very much recently. Um, the, the SSI space, the self-sovereign identity space has really started to come into its own um, as the digital identity space has. It's a lot noisier um, because I think the, the, general, the general audiences out there um, conflate the two, self-sovereign identity providers and tools with digital identity, and they're not the same. Um, and so this is a really fascinating space. Um, it's a lot more than just helping someone log in. Uh, I see some convergence with what we're gonna talk about in a minute, personal data stores and personal information managers. Um, but then the other place where we've seen this really come into the forefront, recent discussions of the last year is when we start looking around healthcare uh, and COVID and you know, so-called the immunity passports and COVID passports. Um, are really completely leveraging self-sovereign identity, right? Um, so it'll be really interesting to see, I think, how these play out. But to me, this is really a technology layer. Um, and though a lot of those companies would disagree strongly with me, um, you know, I mentioned earlier that there is, uh, the key to the adoption is, is make what you're doing kind of invisible and just yeah. really be a quiet utility, uh, SSI doesn't work that way. Um, so um, the average person down the street isn't gonna buy the technology. Uh, they're gonna buy what it gets them. They don't care about the technology and they don't care who provides it. Yeah, and if they're the infrastructure, I mean, that's not a bad place to be. The question is that whatever is built on a blockchain when it comes to personal data, as of today, is facing a huge challenge. There's no way you can propagate certain rights that have to be there. You, go, you won't even be able to control whether data is crossing nas national boundaries. And now these days with all of these, with the SREMS, you know, um, a court case and all of the inability that companies have in Europe to send data over to the US in a blockchain where there's no, the, the country, the, the very concept of the country doesn't exist. Yeah, I think the, I think the um, early players in this space, uh, it's just to your point, there's nothing wrong with the infrastructure. And in fact, the SSI companies, organizations, um, products that are out there, um, the one, I believe the ones that will, will do well are the ones that realize that they are infrastructure yeah. um, and they stop trying to be consumer products uh, because you know, having built the standard or having built the infrastructure, that's huge. Um, you know, there are many companies out there, startups that we've both worked on, um, open source projects that, that we've worked on. There's a lot out there that are built on these standards and infrastructure, even before they were adopted as standards and infrastructure. Um, and, you know, it might not be the consumer vision um, that a lot of these companies thought they would be, but they're impacting and, and uh, being utilized. But 
probably a lot more people than they ever would have been able to if they had gone out as a consumer tool. So. Good point. Good point. Okay. So moving on, personal data stores, and they could also be there. I mean, some of them, I guess they want to be the platform, in fact. But what do you think? We've seen, I'd, I'd say, the same companies for a few years now. Like uh, Solid has been around. Before Solid, we had Digimi, maybe for a few years. We've got uh, Poly Poly in Germany. So a few examples, but uh, personal data stores in themselves, do you see value in themselves in, in the personal data store as a concept? Does it evolve? What's your view? Yeah, this was one of the two areas that uh, I was probably really interested in uh, early on. Uh, and then I worked on a couple of them. And, you know, I don't know what the uptake's going to be. I think they're a lot of work. Uh, and I think companies are still trying to make this happen online as a service. They're trying to do it as hardware. They're trying to make it device-based where it all sits locally on your phone. Uh, I just think they're really complicated for most people still. Um, if we can get to a point where they're easy to use, um, and once again, they have good utility, um, then potentially, and this is another place um, where that utility of a COVID passport is coming up a lot with the personal data stores. Can't you store your vaccination info in a personal data store and just share it whenever you need it, right? Um, but I think that's a complicated concept for, for non-techies. Yeah, so in a way, they're making things complex. But at the same time, the problem that I have with personal data stores is that they oversimplify another thing, which is that personal data is not always the same. It's not like a collection of data that you just store and it belongs to you as in it belongs to you as in property or ownership or as if it were some, so something that is so clearly defined. In the end, you interact with all of these digital properties and data just you know comes out of it. And sometimes data is born and out of that interaction, it dies right then. And, and so, you know, trying to amass everything and, lock it all, lock it in. I find it very confusing. Yeah, the personal data store to me is interesting because that's one of those, the, the way they've generally been designed or, or what we've seen to date, uh, models on, you know, a paper file cabinet system still, yes. which was adopted then on our local machines, right? Our filing systems and emails or how we file our files. Uh, on our hard drives, and it's just taking that out a step further with our personal data, right? So, um, you know, does that, is that really, it, it's innovative in the way it's done, certainly, um, but it doesn't do it for me because to your point, data is really fluid now, right? It, it, it's not, in a paper system, this piece of paper is only good for one thing. In a digital system, you have this whole new world, right, where this piece of paper might be really useful in a healthcare environment setting, or it might be really useful for my shopping setting. And there's bits and pieces of it that apply in certain, certain realms. But if you think of a personal data store as a very static yeah. box where you keep everything, it's just digital, which is the analog taken digital. Um, it doesn't take advantage of all of that. And I think it's just, you know, like you said, it, 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 on one hand, it oversimplifies everything. On the other hand, it's really complicated to use. And so many things that are co-produced between you and the digital property and you and someone else, you and I are on the call now, right now on this call and producing something that is unique. Do we split it? Your voice goes one right. way, my voice goes another. But there's so many other things that we're producing at once. And as we interact with the platform, the platform itself, like, you know, whatever we're using to record it, is also the sort of the one, yeah, it is the platform that will decide what data gets produced because as you create a digital property, you define the data points that get created in you know interacting with it. So I think that's such a good point. They may be the product of an old mentality, which would explain why we are so passionate about it or initially we were because maybe it belongs to either our generation or the one before us, which is very sad to think, <laughs> which is a very sad idea. <laughs> it, these are platforms for all people. So uh, Tim Berners-Lee uh, would be very depressed to hear this, this episode of the podcast. Uh, let's move on to the next chapter. Well, I think it's a, 
I think that the, you know, talking about uh, the personal data store yeah. in the context that we were just talking about, about it being a black box, um, you know, a paper-based system moved to the web and beyond. Um, but your points about, you know, this piece of data, who does this belong to, you know, our mm -hmm. data together, together we're creating new data, right? Yeah. Um, it used to be called data exhaust in the early days of privacy. And we were worried about what happens to the data exhaust. Hey, you know, yes, what yes. about those digital trails that we leave behind, right? Now there's just so much of it that there are entire, entire industries built upon that data exhaust, right? That we know well. Yeah. Um, Back in the day, but when I you think could collect a, all that data. Right? And not know what to uh, do with it. I, I think it, it's a really good uh, segue, if you will, in, into a couple of the other um, my data business models that you were bringing up, um, because this is where I think the convergence is really, really happening. And there's a lot of startups happening um, when we start thinking about um, uh, those, the data as intellectual property. Um, or the product of the use of the data as intellectual property. Yeah. Um, that's where it starts to get really messy and really interesting. Um, and that's where the very fine points to me of uh, stated privacy policies or the fine print in a contract are going to be, become so important. Yes, that's, yeah, that's a good point. Um, we have discussed that in the past and uh, in fact, in a couple of, uh, of interviews. So if we move on to brand relationship management tools and this in, this in the end, the idea is here is how we apply the whole idea of my data or control and transparency to the relationship that people have with, with brands and, and publishers. So very much aligned with our mission within Privacy Cloud, I have to say. But in that space, so again, sometimes we've used the word or the term personal information management systems to just go broader or, or sort of in a, to go more abstract than you know, personal data stores. But the idea here is platforms that are helping people interact with companies and get closer to that demand-led world where it's people that decide what data they expose or share when they see when they see what companies can do with that data, what do you think about that? Yeah, so this is where I think the biggest the biggest convergence of two data models is happening. If I can jump ahead to the ACE data model, which is the personal data marketplace, uh, you might have left that till the end because it's the most exciting, and you know um, that I could talk about that for hours. Um, but uh, I think that the the personal information system on its own is challenging um, because most people don't know what they can do with their data. Most people don't know what is being done with their data. Um, so this personal information management, brand relationship management tools are really focused to, to me around agency and they're super yeah. important. Um, but agency alone isn't enough. So I have agency with of my data. What does that mean, right? Yeah. Um, but when you start creating something around what you can do with your personal data, then it becomes really, really interesting, right? Yes. Um, so brand relationship management tools, personal information management tools to me are a little bit of the future of a loyalty program, right? If I have agency over that loyalty program and instead of a store taking all my loyalty program data and just selling it to a data broker, if instead, that loyalty program exists only to help that store because I, I shop there and I've agreed to, you can use my data in aggregate form to A, make better business decisions about what type of products you're going to buy at wholesale to sell to me at retail. And you use that data in order to send me offers. Um, that's Things like that to me are where the utility will happen. Uh, around the information management system. Yeah. Um, I think one of the things that we're seeing, you know, we see some platforms out there that are really interesting. Um, you know, I'll mention one, Roamina is one, where they're really giving you the opportunity to see all of the data that the loyalty programs have about you, all of the data that 
your credit card companies hold about you, which we haven't talked about, but that's really scary. Everything you've shopped for, everything you've browsed for, your credit card company knows, right? Um, and so companies like Romina are letting you see that. Um, and it remains to be seen, you know, who's going to benefit the most from that, what a company like that might provide to the stores or the credit card companies or the agency that they might provide you uh, as a person or as an individual. What am I going to be able to do with that data? Am I actually going to have agency with it and be able to tell the store, don't use it? Um, or does it want me to do something else with it? Does it then become a personal data marketplace where suddenly you're going to tell me I can sell the data, right? So this is where these things get really, it gets a little bit more fluid uh, and, and a lot more interesting to me. That's so. very good. You know, something that I was just thinking, yes, that the main difference between this and then just ending up in sort of the easy way out, which is the personal data marketplace, well, okay, so here's their agency. That's what's happening to your data now. Take this data, get money for it, and let's dump it into the same place, into this, you know, just, just perpetuate the problem. And we discussed that, uh, again, in the past, during a few interviews, but the idea is the one thing that this entails to make it work and not fall into a personal data marketplace is that there's got to be a tool for the businesses to leverage what you decide to show. So this one requires both pieces, not just something to show to people and let them sell and then just, you know, off it goes and, you know, so long agency, but something that is available to companies so that as you decide to show certain preferences or, or data, then they can really react to it. Yeah. Okay. So the next one are declared data platforms. And this, this is about pooling data that is anonymous or pseudonymized where, you know, you get all these surveys and people asking, and there's been platforms like this that had nothing to do with my data and with, you know, empowering people with their data. Simply, it's been about asking them. In the end, when we talk about zero-party data, I believe many people, particularly email marketing platforms and so on, confuse, from my point of view, zero-party data with this, which is people answering surveys. I don't think it's about service. And I believe there's platforms that do justice to the idea of declared data platforms like Zero and Me, where you do share things in a way that you are always in control and you can see the impact of what you're sharing. What do you think of that space? I, I'm, I hate to sound uh, repetitive, but I think that, that that is part of the convergence that we see with yeah. the personal data marketplace, um, with the brand relationship management tools um, and a, a, one other business model out there that we haven't talked about yet. Um, being able to see what happens with my data is super important. And I think that's the first step. Um, you know, as we, as we've talked about, most people don't know what happens with the data that's being collected. Most people don't know what data is being collected, what happens with it, who's using it, what they're using it for, how it benefits me, how it benefits, you know, the common good, um, or how it benefits bad actors, right? Um, and so I, I think there's a lot of, there's always been a lot of exciting potential here. Um, this is one of the areas to me that's a really slippery slope. I mean, we've talked about healthcare was one that, that you and I had talked about before, and this is an area where, you know, we see, healthcare research data get used in a really bad way um, without people's knowledge. So this has a lot of potential um, for good and a lot of potential for harm, I think, in the, the de declared data space. Um, it doesn't get a lot of attention from us necessarily, um, but I think it's important to be able to see, um, you know, how is my data used? Where was my data used in the aggregate? in the aggregate, right? Yep. Um, so, you know, okay. I think it's a good space. Okay, there were, there's two more, and one of them was attention management. This was pretty small, but something that at the time I found interesting is that they were playing with attention as something that normally goes bundled with data, but it doesn't have to. Like today, attention and tracking are part of the advertising ecosystem, but if you manage to split them, then attention is something that can be 
again monetized it can be you know business models can be built on that on attention not just you know paying people to watch ads as it happened with one of the platforms that we were commenting on two years ago which is called bitter and i understand now it's uh it's been discontinued but many others where they pay you to again to answer a few questions but this time yeah with that in mind attention management and survey-based market research from that point of view rather than rather than monetizing your data or anything like that yeah it's 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 um it's interesting the attention management you know your your attention becomes currency rather than your data um but the quiet part that doesn't get said out loud is your attention becomes the currency instead of your data yes um but then your attention becomes data so you've traded your attention as currency. Um, so your data itself wasn't the currency, your attention was, um, but it's turned into data as currency by whomever you, you provided your attention to, right? Um, we're seeing, I, I don't know if it was Gartner or Forrester, we're seeing a lot of this around the, the so-called voice of the customer. It's, it's, it's whole own sector now, right? Yeah. It used to be people used to just do surveys. Um, and, uh, it, you know, these last four, you know, my data business models for me are the ones that are kind of very fluid right now. And I think everybody in each of these, what used to be four discrete business models, everybody's testing the waters in each of the other three of these four. These are really consumer facing ones um, where there's a lot of startup, startup activity, right? So companies that used to focus on attention management um, are also now moving into the personal data marketplace space, right? Or um, companies that are working with brand relationship management are now also going into the personal data marketplace space. Good point. So let's um, go into so. that ourselves. Uh, let's so yeah. let, let, let's go ourselves into that one. That's the last one. And it's uh, it's always been, you know, in, in the heart of the debate, what do you think? Personal data marketplaces, we keep seeing stuff. We keep seeing them, you know, they come and go. There's been many that we listed two years ago that are mostly gone. But what do you think? Uh, I, I think that these are the ones that are um, paving the way for the ones that are going to stick. Um, you know, sometimes there's something, you know, you and I always laugh about the concept of being third or fourth to market sometimes is easier. Uh, personal data marketplaces are premised around data as currency. Um, and the ability of me to use my data as a rival good and to sell it to someone else. Um, and personally, I have issues with that. As you know, uh, I don't think data should be currency. Um, I think it creates an entire different system because the person that's going to sell their data for a you know two dollar gift card to Amazon um, is probably the person that's collecting cans to go take to the recycler um, or you know or worse right um, so I think they're a fun game at first. I think yes. we're going to see a lot of early adoption, like, oh, hey, did you know I just joined this platform and I was able to sell my data and I got this like five dollar voucher after, you know, I signed away my firstborn child. That's you know, it's uh, just just it's as we see slope. with like Facebook, it's very slippery slope. You know, we see it with Facebook games, we see it with online games. Um, people give up a lot of data because they think there's novelty in it when the reality of what they're doing hits them, uh, it, you see a big drop off, right? Right now we see it with the app that plays with your face. People are starting to understand what happens with that and they're not as excited about it. Um, when people start trying to monetize their data and they realize that their data is only private for three months um, and then their data is not private anymore, or that they sold their data for seven cents and someone probably just sold it for many thousands of dollars, um, then these are less interesting, I think. So uh, what I think will be interesting is where the personal data marketplaces go um, after the concept of monetizing one's own data uh, is a little bit less novel. I don't know how long that's gonna be before that happens, but that's where the convergence of these these four and the fluidity of these last four my data business models 
I think it's really interesting because I, I think it's a, it's a wait and see. Yeah. Very good. Those are great insights. So you were right, Celine, you were inspired. So this was great. Thank you. Yeah, no, thank you. Uh, it's been fun uh, to continue to talk about the business models and see how quickly they're evolving. I mean, when you first wrote this, what, a year and a half ago, um, you and I hadn't even met at this point in December True. 2019. True. Um, but there has been amazing, amazing uh, growth in the space. Yes. Um, there's been evolution in the space in really just you know, a short 18, 19 months. Um, and so I, I think the momentum is finally here. Uh, it's exciting to see it happen for those of us that have been watching it for a decade. Um, you know, and I look forward to uh, having this conversation in another 18 months. Um, hopefully we'll have a lot of things to celebrate uh, in the whole space uh, as well as uh, with our own, our own venture. So I agree. Thank you, Celine. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Thanks so much for, uh, for taking the time to talk about this. It's been great. Thank you. Okay, that's all for today. Please find episode notes and links to our social channels and other feeds on mastersofprivacy.com. Please do not give us five stars on your favorite podcasting channel unless you believe there is no more room for improvement. Your candid feedback is probably more useful to us. Thank you.